Hello, and welcome to the Media Copilot. It's a podcast that explores how AI is changing media, journalism, and content creation. I'm Pete Paschal, longtime tech journalist and founder of the Media Copilot, and I'm excited to bring you fascinating conversations with fellow journalists, media executives, and the people building all the ways we'll create and consume news in the future. Today, I'm thrilled to talk to Joanna Stern. Joanna's the senior personal tech columnist at the Wall Street Journal. She and I used to see each other quite often at various tech events when I was the tech editor at Mashable. She's well known for her clever tech videos and her deep reporting on how the titans of Silicon Valley are altering our lives in big and small ways. But this week, she's making a name for herself by being an AI innovator. Normally, this time of year, she'd have a big review of the latest iPhones. But instead, she gave the world Joanna Bot, an AI chatbot created by the journal tech team and Joanna herself designed to give readers all the advice they could possibly want about buying the iPhone 16 or iPhone 16 Pro. As soon as I saw Joanna Bot, I knew I wanted to talk to Joanna about it. Not just because it's a wildly interesting AI experiment from a major publisher, but also because I've been dying to get Joanna's thoughts on the big picture of AI, how far it's come, what's on the horizon, and how it's changed the way she does her job. It was a really fun conversation, and I hope you listen to the end where I squeeze out of her what she really thinks of Apple intelligence, Apple's upcoming feature upgrade to the iPhone that adds AI, and how that will change what we think of as consumer AI. If you enjoy the conversation, as ever, I'd encourage you to share it with a friend or a colleague, and I'd be grateful if you'd consider subscribing to the Media Copilot newsletter if you haven't already. That's the link in the show notes. And I'd also appreciate it if you'd leave a rating or review in whatever podcast app you're in. Those really do help the show get in front of more people. Lastly, you can check out everything we offer, including AI training classes for media, marketing, and PR professionals at mediacopilot.ai. All right, enough with all that. Here's my conversation with Joanna Stern, Senior Personal Tech Columnist for The Wall Street Journal. Joanna, welcome to the Media Copilot. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. Oh, yeah, good to see you. I feel like we haven't chatted in a long time, which is probably true because I've been kind of out of the gadget scene for a while. I, I, I'm still here. I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Only, only the strong survive, Pete. Only the strong survive. Yeah, it, clearly, clearly. <laughs> uh, but now you're also an AI creator. That's or, right. Uh, almost kind of like startup founder or something. I'm not sure what what the, the right term is, but. Uh, you've created Joanna Bot along with some help from your peeps at, at the journal, right? That's right. That's right. I am the real yeah. Joanna, but we're going to, Joanna Bot's very excited to be here today too. Uh, it, it is running up on my computer screen. <laughs> it, I'm glad it. you have, you've got your pronouns straight on, on what it is. It, it, it's tough because I keep wanting to call it her, but it's just not, it's not right. It's not right. So why was the first thought at becoming an AI creator to create a replacement for yourself? Well, it's not a replacement. It's an assistant. Mm. It's an Got assistant it. to myself because I keep saying, and you've heard that, I mean, this is the perfect place to talk about this, which is this big promise that all the AI executives and the whole industry is talking about is that this is going to save us time. It's going to save us from the drudgery of our work. And I'm right. not all of our work, but I'm, I'm not saying reviewing the iPhone is drudgery, but as I point out in this piece, you know, I've been doing it for many years. I, I've been at the journal for 10 years and I've reviewed the iPhone for 10 years at the journal or wow. some version of iPhone or iPhone software for 10 years. Congratulations. And thank you. Thank you. Um, you had, uh, did you, did we pass that anniversary? We did. It, did you have a party or something? I did not have a party. You know, <laughs> okay. you just keep working right. and you just keep hoping well, this, you'll have a job. Party. This okay. is my party. Yeah. Um, but you know, you you reviewed iPhones back in the day, and mm -hmm. really Couple. since the iPhone 12, this has been the same looking phone, right? This is the, we're at the 16 now. That's not to say there haven't been drastic improvements since the 12. Uh, the 12 was the first with 5G, so we're we're well into the era of 5G here. Sorry, I didn't. I want to make sure I'm on Do Not right. Disturb. Okay, we're well yeah. into the era of 5G here, and so we look. We've we've had a lot of improvements over the last number of years, but it, a lot of it's repetitive. Every year I'm mm -hmm. saying a lot of the same stuff, right? I am focusing on the new features, but I'm also giving a lot of the same advice I give every year. I went back and looked at these reviews and I was like, I've been saying the same thing every year, which is buy what's important for you. Buy when your phone is 
done when you need a new phone and then you'll get these new features and you're probably going to upgrade when you're ready. And the battery life is a little better and the camera is a little better and all of the things. And I say it a lot over and over yeah, again. You're and actually so I thought, z- zeroing in on a little bit of why I got a little disillusioned with gadget reporting, but that's another story. And actually, I don't even do that much gadget reporting anymore, which is interesting. But I thought, okay, this might be an opportunity to use AI, right? And uh, that was sort of where the project started and and ended, too. <laughs> yeah. So um, tell me about how that sort of came to be. So you, you kind of like, okay, with the iPhone is coming. Like, was it your idea? Like, you know what? Why don't I just do a, have a bot do my thing? And then take me into sort of the brainstorming session that resulted and and how that ended up being Joanna Bot. Yeah, I love being on this podcast because I feel like this is where I could really get into the details. Like, the, <laughs> you're the yes. audience. Your audience wants this this kind of backstory. Oh, yes. So we have an AI committee at the Wall Street Journal. Every newsroom has an AI committee. Every every organization sure. in the world right now has an AI committee, and sometimes <laughs> they're really productive and sometimes they aren't. But ours is super productive because we've got a bunch of really smart journalists in the room and some engineers in the room. Some that are both and engineers who just are great, great journalists and vice versa. And so we had started brainstorming what we could possibly create using generative AI that was just based on our reporting. So there are two people I'm going to call out that were are on this committee and who worked on this project with me. One's Rob Barry and the other is Brian Witten. Both of them are engineers and journalists. And we start, they started building this tool a few months back, uh, where it was basically we were able to ground the Google Gemini model using Vertex, which is their cloud solution that you can sort of get the behind the scenes tools. Uh, they they started working mm-hmm. on this tool and it, they worked really hard to figure out, okay, how can we just ground it based where it's really just fed on our own Wall Street Journal reporting? And we got it to a really good place, but we kind of didn't have the right content or editorial to pair it with. And okay. yeah. that's really to say like, okay, we we knew that there were some issues with all generative AI. And I'm actually writing a column now about some of the things that I've learned from this process, which, you know, you know, but then you don't really know it till you're building. And so we were building this and we started realizing, okay, yeah, it hallucinates sometimes. We've done a really good job of getting it to stay on topic. It doesn't want to go on topic, especially with the iPhone. Like we did a lot in the back end to make sure, you know, if that, if you're asked about this, you stay on the iPhone topic, you stay on the iPhone yeah. topic. And um, so we just were really looking for the right content. It's like, you don't want to pair this with election coverage because that's too risky. You don't really want to pair this with international events or markets or stuff where there's, you know, the stakes are a lot higher. And then I was on a run a few weeks ago and I was like, what am I going to do for the iPhone review? And then I was like, wait, I know the perfect low stakes thing for this tool. It's the iPhone. Because if Mm, it gets ports wrong, it's not really a problem. I mean, we don't want right. it to. And frankly, we, we got to a really good place with this not making stuff up. But if someone is kind of misled about the iPhone Pro versus an iPhone Plus, like it's yeah. it's not the end of the world. They, that's, they can always just take it back. Right. <laughs> yeah, we could just be like the journals robot, but and, I think and, the people at the Apple store will understand. And also it was like this was a small subject, right? It was mm. it was a pretty narrow where and and we can get into like what the bot knows, but basically like we right. we fed the f- fed this system my many years of iPhone reviews, some specs around the recent 10 iPhones or so. And then mm. a document that I ended up writing for the bot because it was getting a lot of things confused and I realized, you know, when you kind of look at the sliding scale, like it doesn't really know that the iPhone 8 isn't a good choice right now. So I had to be pretty specific. I wrote this other document. I wrote about, about like a 12 to 14 page document where I was just really clear with the bot in sort of prompts. This is what is important mm-hmm. to me in terms of iPhone buying. And this is my advice. And, you know, don't buy based on this, don't buy based on this, or you know, I really like the dynamic Island. And I think that's a really important feature and stuff like that. So this is all to say, that's the backstory. We just thought this would be a good subject pairing to experiment. And we really viewed this as an experiment because we learned a lot from this. And it also was published, you know, for your listeners that haven't seen this, it is published within 
my article, which is really clear about why I did this, what information right. this was based on, and it has my iPhone 16 review or my test notes. So I felt like if the bot's getting it wrong, at least the person on the page can go see what real Joanna says about this. Mm-hmm. And there isn't any mistake about what is the source material and what is true. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for sharing all that on sort of what you ended up doing, particularly all the sort of crafting you had to do around the prompts and stuff. Because I think your story really underscores a, a lot of the challenges that go hand in hand when you introduce chat with like essentially a corpus, right? So um, the fact that your bot got confused by just sort of here's the content and surface and just expecting it to surface the right things it sound like that's really common. You know, you it, there's a there's a reason I think a lot of media sites have not yet intro- really introduced chat in a big way, right? Because when you get a large corpus, you're going to get a lot of information that's come out at different times. It's inevitably going to be contradictory. And yeah, you you can introduce rules and hierarchies about all that, but that's work. You know, that's that's what I guess they call knowledge management, right? It Which is. is. Exactly right what you've done with your and, uh, and and I will say like from the uh, you're totally hitting on this I thought this is a great idea Joanna like I'm on this run this is a great idea now I just got to get someone to prove this and then I realized like okay and I'm thinking to myself too during that period like this is going to be so much easier than writing a review you know that that truly <laughs> like and I say this like there's still an art to writing reviews and there's still a human element that we must have with reviews, which is the testing part and how this fits into our lives and the comparisons like that is, that's not going away, but like the sitting down to write the thing that, and try to make that feel different than what you wrote before. Like that's the hard part. Like that's the part Mm -hmm. that's really like I struggle with these days. Like how do I stay creative? And I've always tried to bring creativity to my work. It's like, how do I stay creative? But it's just the same kind of thing. Right. And then I was like, okay, so this is going to be easier this year. I'm just, the bot will do it all. And then I realized, no, this is so mm-hmm. much harder than sitting down and writing the challenging creative review. Because as you said, I was developing these tools in the background. I was rewriting things and we knew it would get things wrong. And then we were going back in and tweaking the corpus. And we were, it was a lot of back and forth to get this thing right. Yeah, like beyond just, writing it yourself you're it's almost like you're teaching an intern to write and write like you right so you're kind of like it ends up being kind of more like double the work yeah and like we were pretty clear in the system prompts like you know you should use these previous reviews as style you can reference them but then we had this other document which was like this is where the core of the stuff should be coming from the the if people ask for these kind of advice or this kind of advice and then there was the iPhone 16 test notes which was a separate thing which was just because we kind of figured most people would be asking about the iPhone 16 and so that should be mm-hmm. its own thing that's layered into the system instructions which is you know, this is the pull from this document when answering from the iPhone 16 about the iPhone 16 yeah yeah i definitely got that so i obviously tried it out checked it out like my experience, uh, I really appreciated that it said kind of a version of what you just told me earlier, that it leveled with me. Like, is is this new phone really any better than the last few years? And it's kind of like, eh, I mean, it's kind of the same phone, even though it's got better, it said something along those lines. But uh, it was very patient when I asked it to explain what photographic styles were, because um, I guess that's a thing. Yep. And when I asked it about competing phones, it definitely deferred to you. It was like, well, I'm not, I'm all about the iPhone. Um, one thing I did notice when I asked if it was heavier than previous phones, the iPhone 16, it, it seemed not to know. I, yeah. I actually jostled it though. I reminded it, don't you have the spec sheets? That's what it says here in the article. It yeah. says, oh, you're right. And yeah. then it came out with it, right? So it's like- But did it but say that your iPhone, yeah, did it say it was like, did, was it wrong? Because one of the things we were having an issue with was weight. Oh, you know what? I, you didn't I didn't fact check it. Check it. Ah. <laughs> See? Bad AI user. But this is, I guess, I'm, I'm probably an example of a typical user that's just totally. going to trust the bot because it sounds confident. Yes, totally. Um, but yeah, it did say it was heavier. Well, I it is. I mean, yeah. right. which is the Pro well, Max. Right. I mean, depends on. Yeah, I think it depends on yeah. which models it, you're it looking at. It also totally punted the ball when I asked about iPhone 17, uh, oh. which I understand that obviously no one outside you know outside of apple and, and maybe mark german knows anything about the I- iphone 17 but um i think you know we can make educated guesses about 
things given the, yeah. the the pattern, right? You know, we all we, everyone sort of talks on all the forums and everything, and what when the design might change and stuff. So that's funny. That's I didn't even something. think to write that in. Well, I was kind of like, if I'm not going to upgrade this year, maybe totally. I'll upgrade next year, you know? And then it's kind of like, you want to know what the one's going to be like next year, but maybe no, that's this just is, a this very is good. small. This is good product QA. We're, yeah. I'm going to go back and uh, <laughs> add in some stuff there. But it's funny, so, as you say those things, like I have spent so much time doing the back and forth and writing what this is pulling from and like knowing very specifically what it's pulling from that I almost know the answers and what we've noticed too is like their answers are always different, but they're quite similar in terms of what the content is. Like, sure, like the way the bot writes it and what joke it might put in or, you know, how it tells you to ask the real Joanna, which is you know, a fallback that we built in. Like most of the time though, like that photographic styles, like I feel like I could know that like it probably referenced my dog in there or some testing I did of the photographic styles. Like those things like I, you know, where I'm like, how much of me is in this? Like, I do feel like I know a lot of the answers that the bot is going to give. Mm -hmm. Nice. And how, what sort of things are people asking it? I, I assume you're getting like a lot of, there's some kind of dashboard you can see what people are asking. I mean, I just gave you my stuff, but is it, is that pretty indicative of what folks are asking? Yeah. I mean, look, we did, I think what's really interesting is, and look, people are lazy. Like we just know this. We just <laughs> in, inherently humans are lazy. And so when you open up the bot, we do give you four suggested prompts, right? What does Joanna think right. of the iPhone 16 models? Make a chart comparing the 16 and the 16 Pro. Those are, of course, by and by and large, the most popular queries because people are clicking them and they just want to see how this thing works. And then, you know, we take it as a good sign of like, okay, then somebody went further and started to, to ask this thing a little bit deeper about what, what phone they have. So we see a lot of like people are asking about their own phones. Like I have, you know, the iPhone SE, what kind of improvements am I going to see? A little bit deeper too, like, and this is maybe, you know, Joanna bot 2.0, like a little bit deeper. Some are trying to go on the specs. Like, right. what about this camera? Is this camera better? Well, you know, how will I see that image quality? And like, I would have loved to have the ability to like pop in photos that I've taken here, but that was, mm. that was, uh, beyond our, our, uh, budget, I guess I'll say and time. Cause uh, <laughs> basically I had this idea of like the week before the event. And I was like, could you think we can get it up and running? And they were like, that seems crazy, <laughs> but let's try. And uh, we, we were able to get it up and running. Um, but yeah, That's those sort of things. Though. Just just having worked in a strategic role at newsrooms and like getting something from an idea to publishable that isn't just an article, uh, impressive. Uh, give my kudos to the team over there. Yeah, and I will say, I mean, our our uh, head of our AI committee happens to be our deputy editor in chief, Charles Farrell, and he has been very much just like, let's we've got to experiment. If we don't start learning, we're not going to know how this will affect our work or can improve our work. So he was very just so encouraging to, to us to say, keep trying, keep trying. And um, so, well, that, yeah. That leads to my next question, which of course is, is this, is this a stunt or is it something that is going to maybe not be exactly the template for, you know, what the, you want to do with AI, especially with respect to your coverage, but is it a new feature or a new format? Are we going to see more stuff adapted to a chat interface? Do you think? So I think this gets to what you talk about here a lot and you cover a lot, which is the innate or intrinsic shortcomings of generative AI right now. And I just saw them so clearly. And I've been covering this for two years. I've been talking to the top people, sitting down with like all the top executives and top CEOs of these companies for two years now, asking questions. And, and I really didn't feel like I fully grasped it till I was in it. And I was like, oh, yeah, this costs a lot of money. Is the return here really worth it? Right? So there's like there, just everything, the cost to the errors to the hallucinations. There was a trade-off with everything we did. Um, and I'm going to write a little bit more about that in the, this column. But I think I think that the – I was worried at first this was going to set a bad precedent. Like, oh, here comes along a top columnist and they're just going to try to replace themselves. And then, oh, maybe it replaces them and I've done a really bad thing and I've set this bad precedent in the industry. 
that the opposite happened. I mean, I really think the opposite happened, which was that I got a ton of email from people saying I missed your voice. I got a ton of people being like, where's your video? I'm always looking for the video. Um, so it really emphasized to me like where my voice and my worth is, mm-hmm. right? But I really started also drinking the Kool-Aid of what everyone's saying, which is like, why should I be sitting here regurgitating iPhone specs and writing that out? That's not that's not a good use of my talent. Um, and it, honestly, it's not really a good use of any even, you know, more junior journalists talent. Um, so I, I think I think that there's something more to do here. I'm not sure I'm going to be the one to do it. Um, but I do think we're going to see more news organizations look at it for this type of role. Yeah. I like, you know, it's interesting. The the whole idea of like AI taking over, you know, I think what you sort of said, drudgery, but I, I, I don't think that's what you mean. And then it's just that once things are repeatable and predictable, you like, there should be some kind of automation component to it, Yeah, you know? And so even though as, as important as the iPhone reviews are, um, can we ensure that your voice, et cetera, is maximized maybe in other ways. Maybe it's not necessarily the iPhone review. I mean, you did it here because obviously it's a very high profile thing, but there are other things yeah. um, in any reporter's life that that certainly um, could benefit from that kind of approach. And so, look, yeah. I also think about like, I, uh, and this, I, you have the long history of doing gadget reviews, but like, I have gotten out of that business a little bit. Like, it's not that people necessarily turn to me anymore with what, um, you know, Android phone is best or what, what printer to buy though. I always do like every few years I do do a printer column, but I look more at like sort of the holistic ways that this tech is affecting consumers. And I try to stay on top of those trends without, you know, sure. I always do some of the bigger new products, but I s- try to look at it as more of like a trend of this is a thing that is happening, right? Like I, I think a great example is like, I never really reviewed the, the new version of the Ray-Ban Meta glasses. Right. But I have written about them a number of times saying they are one of the best products to come along in a long time and talked about the way it infuses AI and the way that it is changing photography. So maybe it gives, this is to say like maybe the bot or this type of tech could be more of those nitty gritty questions that I don't Mm -hmm. necessarily tackle anymore, but a reader may want to know, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think, you know, uh, I want to actually want to ask you more about, um, uh, the broader gadget system for the Ray-Bans and, and a lot of some of the companies you're talking about, but before we depart entirely from Joanna Bot, I did have one more thing I wanted to ask about because you explicitly said, you know, there's a, uh, there's, there's a bit of a subtext to it. You made a text and that like, yeah, there's these the 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 re- repeatedness of these reviews you're sort sort of saying the same things every year let's see what um we can get a bot to do but the other thing i read into it which i don't think you did say was that the only thing really interesting about this iteration of the iphone and ios is apple intelligence and we don't really have that yet and yeah. You know, in other words, like if I, if you as a, as a tech writer are going to concentrate your fire on anything this fall, uh, it should be that feature set and not the hardware itself. Is that fair to say? Totally fair to say. And I did have like that point in there. I also like thought that was a very meta way, not that meta, but this meta, you know, way of um, doing this review because like this new iPhone is supposed to be all about AI. Well, okay, here AI is doing the the review for you too. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I look like. I have been running Apple Intelligence. They did um, offer 18.1 on some of the review units, but it's not ready yet. And that was a tricky thing. Like I am going to do an Apple Intelligence review and do an Apple Intelligence piece because I think it's very important to do. But I did not believe that that was the thing driving people to make decisions on day one. Uh, I don't Mm -hmm. really think it's going to be the thing driving people to make decisions at all, really, for at least a number of months. But um, Interesting. We can talk oh, about uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. What are your thoughts on um, Apple intelligence? I've written about it a few times. Obviously, their whole shtick is we're not just doing AI, we're doing AI plus the personal, the things you have in your phone, and we're doing some Apple magic with it. Uh, so far, has that sort of been your experience? Or and even if it's not, what do you think of that vision? I love the vision. I think it's exactly where Apple can 
do things that nobody else can. Maybe Google to a degree if you have an Android phone. Um, and I will say like the number one thing I kind of like so far about Apple Intelligence, I'm running it on the 16 Pro Max and I've been running it on it for the last couple of days, is the summaries of the notifications. Mm, right. I find them helpful for just groupings. Let me let me just read you some if I still have any. But also they're hilarious. They're just like <laughs> totally hilarious because it just like it is the least helpful things at, at some points. Um, like for one, like one thing I do find like it groups them and does like a summary. So I have my garage door alerts me all the time because I'd like to know when it's open or closed. <laughs> and it's really smart. It's like just says like multiple status changes for garage door. It was recently closed. Like that's helpful. Example right, of, yeah. of helpful. Right. Okay. But then like. Some of the headlines, like especially around email or notifications, it's just so wrong and funny. Yeah, I'm kind of curious. Like I saw the email summaries that they're going to change that uh, pre-header text into something that is more more summarizing what it is. And uh, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I mean, it's it's reducing friction is kind of the whole idea, which is a concept I come back to a lot. Um, particularly with a lot of these AI summarization engines like Perplexity or whatever, if you're reducing the friction from someone to the information they need, that's you know that's all what that's what AI all is a lot of the time these days, and especially with respect to media. So if they're doing that with even with notifications, why not? Yeah, and like, but then it like it gets things right. Like the Slack ones are hilarious because you get like, and this is part about like the frequency and the content of the notifications. And it's again like the same thing, similar to what I had with Joanna Bot. Like it doesn't know how to make sense of a huge corpus of text, right? It's like mm. I was like probably had like ten messages back and forth with a colleague the other day, and just was like, this was the re- like the groupings, negative response, discouraged from visiting SF frequently. <laughs> okay what Interesting. which is almost like, like, the I was AI like goes, i'm not gonna read all that well wait a minute you're the ai you're supposed to read all that right like or uh, it reads it and it's like doesn't know what to prioritize and so right. like you see those shortcomings but and but like i'm focusing on this because i do think this is one of the places it can be quite helpful um mm-hmm. and then i just see right now a lot of what has been promised is not here um you sort of run out yeah. of things you can be using or apple intelligence with um yeah the rewriting is nice right like that's now built into notes or you can (laughs) my favorite thing is to rewrite text messages to people um Mm -hmm. and like see what it what it comes up with is it good i mean this is something i kind of um i'm excited to see but also kind of fear is the wrong word but because apple is such a, a pervasive ubiquitous brand and in my mind, I feel like uh, AI arriving on the iPhone is going to be like what people start to think of as AI, even more so than ChatGPT, just because it's it's going to be everywhere, right? Yeah. Um, so if it like the quality of this stuff is going to matter uh, in a big way, it is. I mean, look, I think like at this point, like you know, I can't say which is doing best of rewriting an email to your boss. Like, you know, the stakes are pretty low. Uh, like, mm. So some of the rewriting is like decent and that it, it works. Um, I probably ha- like need to ch- test it more on some more like complex documents and see what I think, you know, compare it with, with some of the other LLMs out there. Um, look, I think the biggest thing, like my biggest takeaway is just Siri has such a far way to go. Um, mm. And I think that's yeah. just the biggest place that Apple needs to win or needs at least to be better in some places than the previous Siri. It's not even like we're like, hey, get as good as Chat GPT or get as good as Google Gemini as an assistant. It's just like get Siri better. Mm. And that is just it's not here yet. There does seem to be something visceral about voice that makes it higher stakes inherently. Because you think about also Amazon that's obviously been working on uh, some kind of AI version of Alexa. And the idea of someone doing, you know, the millions of Siri or Alexa users a recording of mm-hmm. the either assistant that they've tricked into saying just vile things or swearing like crazy in that default voice would have such a viral effect that, totally. I mean, these big corporations are just going to like, like that even more than like a piece of text that just comes out because you could sort of make any number of excuses for that and then just wouldn't go viral in the same way. Makes me think we could probably already have something like this 
you know, and I think OpenAI is kind of showing that, even though not everyone, actually very few people have that advanced voice mode yet. But um, there's just a there's just a fear of of this this uh, bad experience, and which will probably be something that someone just creates, right? Like just just deliberately hacks that's preventing us from getting it. I don't know. That's just more of a rant. No, I think you're totally <laughs> right. I think you're totally right. And that's the question I think Apple's going to have to play, right? Like they're playing it safe. They're playing it safe by delaying this a month after the iPhone release. They are taking a hit, right? They're mm-hmm. they're marketing this, as you said, they're marketing this everywhere with Apple intelligence and you can't get it. The store is lit up with this glow time, which is the way that you get to Siri and you cannot get this better Siri. And frankly, I'm using this better Siri and it's not that much better. I mean, I will hold my full review Mm. till I've spent more time with it and hopefully have some other versions of this, but like, that's where we're at right now. So they are Mm. playing it safe. I think they're playing it safe because of exactly what you said, right? Like this is, I mean, they've narrowed it down to the 15 pros and the 16s, but still that's like more users than most of these companies. Yeah. So, um, and, it, but like you try the new chat GPT experience, the, the voice assistant, whatever they're calling the, what is it? Uh, advanced voice right. mode. Look at advanced voice mode. Right. And it's good. I mean, mm. it's so good. Like it just how quick it responds and how conversational it is. I mean, it is really good. Similar with Google Gemini. Like it's, it is a thing you can just converse with. It is not what we have all thought about when we think about Siri. Mm. And another thing that, um, that sort of reduces that friction is the wearability of some of this stuff. So we had the humane pin, we had the rabbit gadget, uh, I guess I, I'd briefly like to get your thoughts on that. Uh, but, uh, you know, leading into the, the meta Ray bands, which seems to be the one gadget that seems to have, uh, as in terms of wearables in AI as, as fine as, as is some kind of success. I don't know. Yeah. I don't see them a lot, but I hear whenever I hear about them, people seem to really like them. So, so think about like that. What, tell me about your thoughts on that path on. Sort yeah. Of like, I mean, look, I think I did a pretty unique thing when the rabbit and the humane were coming out, everyone was comparing those to each other. And I was like, this is should be compared to the meta Ray-Bans. Like, even though the functionality was a lot less, it's similar idea, right? A wearable or a standalone gadget that takes you away from your phone. But like my conclusion was actually that, yes, this is the this was by far the only one worth buying. The other two were not worth buying, as everyone in the internet said. Um, but the big difference too there is that it connects to your phone. Like both Mm. Humane and Rabbit created these standalone gadgets that like, sure, you could go into like the web portal that was barely working, but, and had cellular connectivity or their own Wi-Fi. It's like, no, like this is the device that connects to everything. We've learned that. Mm -hmm. Like it's the story of the watches. It's the story of the AirPods. Like this is the central device. And it's got the hardware and the connectivity to all the things that you want. And so Meta, even though it's really just functioning in its own app, was smart to do that, right? And you can go in there, you can tweak things or like the way they've even just like engineered the photos to just nicely sync. Like the story of Meta, by the way, like I might, I mean, we can get really nerdy on it. I mean, you like, I think the big thing that we saw, I mean, even you probably covered the snap spectacles of many years ago. Did you cover Many that? Years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. <laughs> There's like, some photo evidence somewhere on the internet. Totally. Like, like the reason that. that that, you know, maybe never took off was one, they like had these limited things, or maybe it was the design. But like I really actually also think it was just like Bluetooth. Like Bluetooth hadn't mm. been as good at that point to sync these photos really quickly and video. So you were just able to quickly get them on your phone and share them. And look, also Meta mm-hmm. like has the infrastructure of Instagram and all the all all of social media, but they've just done a nice job. Like they've just done a really nice job of utilizing the phone and understanding that this is an accessory to the phone. I find it weird that uh, people like the meta glasses and sort of like respect the, their approach to AI and open source, but I don't hear about anyone ever using meta.ai or even like any of the, I guess, search boxes that they have in their various apps as a chat bot. You know, everyone, it always takes them by surprise. Like I'm just searching for a contact or something. Why are you throwing AI in my face? So it's, it's a strange thing that they've, 
gone this way and there are the AIs everywhere on their platform, but it's it's like you don't hear about their chatbot in the same conversations with Gemini and, and ChatGPT. And I think that's also just because of like the use of how we're all thinking about AI right now is like more of a work product, more of a thing where like it's centralized to text. Um, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but like, you know, like, I just don't think of meta in that way. Like, I, I mean, mm-hmm. sure, like threads is now you know, more of a text based product than a photo based product. Um, but like, yeah, I just, yeah, I don't know. I, I went to meta AI when or meta dot AI when I was, you know, first heard about the website and I haven't been back since. Mm. But what do you think just broadly then about sort of chat as an interface and as a way people are doing things? It's, it seems, you know, it's obviously sort of the natural thing with these open-ended uh, chat bots that you can ask anything. But a common thing I always hear about is like, I don't know what to ask it, right? Like it's a, the blinking cursor problem. And it's clearly like there's more to it than chat bots of the past, obviously, because it can talk to you. But uh, I, I wonder about this, particularly with regard to to media in general, not just chatbots like yours, but how much information people are just going to get out of these things and tools like Perplexity and whatever the search product, whenever it gets built into chat GPT. Um, do you see it as sort of a thing that you need to now sort of compete with in, in terms of everything else, all the attention on your audience has to give to all the things they're doing? Now chat is one of them? I mean... Look, I think you're right. Like just as I mentioned before, like the the prompts, the pre-programmed prompts were the most popular thing we gave people. And I think mm-hmm. it's exactly what you're right. Like it's that blinking cursor. They see a blinking cursor and they're like, what am I going to ask this thing? Right? Like even we have ask your question here in the chatbot like, okay, fine. I know I need to write something in there, but like what am I asking it? And this is maybe like the simplest thing for like something that's so narrow, so narrowly focused on, Hey, we know you need to ask about your iPhone. So maybe my example is not the best. Right. But chatting is like, we do it a lot in our personal lives and like messaging, but I don't know. It's like, it is overwhelming and it's like in, task and it's like intensive right like you've got to then like be Mm. focusing on this bot and what does it say back and i have to write back and like i was kind of shocked at how many people sat and talked with this thing for a while um i was like okay i don't have that kind of patience um so the voice stuff i think that's part of why the voice stuff is interesting but of course there's so many places where voice isn't useful like i mean sure i always go to the car Mm. as the place that we all want the like killer ai assistant and thing that just knows what we are talking about how many times have we all like been fighting with siri in the car there's also this great scene i know have you seen the have you seen curb your enthusiasm the last episode the last season no no there's just a great scene where larry david is just cursing at siri in the car and i think it's like that is the one of the places we want just like an assistant that gets it please don't make me repeat myself I, I feel like the rise of voice and AI is at some point going to collide into the return to office movement. <laughs> <laughs> and there's going to be some, uh, a lot of cubicles where there's a lot of yelling matches or something, or just chat conversations with AI that it's going to, it's going to look really, really weird around 2025, <laughs> 2026. What a good excuse for Amazon employees who are being told they need to go back and be like, sorry, I need to stay home to talk to Alexa. <laughs> my routine is all about talking to AI now. It's, yeah. it's going to work in an office. Um, so as you know, I obviously write about how AI is affecting media and journalism. And um, I'm, I'm interested in sort of how you yourself are using AI in your day to day, you know, beyond sort of just checking it out, talking to these companies and occasionally building a chat bot. Like what, how is it, you know, now in your, uh, in your regular routine? I mean, a lo- I would say a lot less related to work and more like, I just, I do use it like a search engine a lot. Um, certainly like, like chat GPT or like chat GPT. I use like, yeah, I use chat GPT a lot just as like a search engine, like to ask it random things about like my kids ask me, I've got a toddler and a seven year old. And so it just comes in handy a lot for like Pokemon history I, I don't, I don't right. know if you've... you've uh, oh, you know. I'm familiar. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that is one place. Like, I get a lot of random questions. I use it for, like, 
cooking and re- recipe. I use it for like a lot of the like traditional things. I, for like actual work, I know this is a question about journalism. I will use it like the occasional um, headline brainstorm or polish up the text, but much more I feel like for like internal emails that I want to make sure look good. <laughs> <laughs> There's like people now that either work for me or I work for like, yes, I had AI polish up the email. Um, like I, I did do this big project a few weeks ago over the last, over the summer about in-flight Wi-Fi, and we covered. I I gathered data from fifty different flights about speeds, speed tests of the Wi-Fi. Of um, we basically asked a lot of people that work in the company, like if you're flying, answer this questionnaire about your in-flight Wi-Fi experience. So I used uh, Vertex, which is Google's corporate product. Um, mm-hmm. Because we use that, you know, we don't want to put any confidential information into ChatGPT, so we're told to use that. I used that in a big way to sort through the responses. It was hugely okay. helpful for that, um, like uploading the spreadsheet, telling me like what are some commonalities, what are where are some things that like is there commonalities to the airlines that are having issues. So some some of the data tools are really really helpful to me. Um, nice. Yeah, I'm fu- definitely seeing that. There's, there's, I forget what it is. There was something I think also at the post they did. The, they're, they're doing a bunch of AI stuff. They have their climate answers, yeah. but they also did a feature recently. What was it? Oh, they were looking at um, political ads, and they yeah. were, they had it, the AI not just look at the text of them, but also sort of look at the imagery and sort of compare, think about a bunch of comparisons. But on hundreds and hundreds of them, where they would have would never have been able to do that many before. So totally, I think, yeah, that's a, I think stuff like that, like. And especially when you're kind of going at it at, with a big data set alone and you don't have you know, a bunch of other people to go through, just giving you some ideas or like top line summaries of what is being seen in there. And it was actually really interesting because I kind of used that as a gut check because I had read through everything and I had made a list of like, what are the top findings that I see here? And like, I want to structure the column in the video this way. And then like I fed it into Vertex and it was like, what are the top findings? that? You, and it was very similar. It was one of the main points that I thought was really interesting was like it picked out that there were inconsistencies on Wi-Fi connections on the same airlines, which was my whole reason of wanting to do the project, um, which was basically a reinforcing like, oh, I knew this thing, but I was really happy to see it come out in the data, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Totally validated what your guts were, mm-hmm. which, uh, yeah, as at, at the very least, AI is a pretty good <laughs> a validator of your yeah. gut. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's let's um, let's project a little forward here as we as we wrap things up. Let's look out, you know, five years further out in the future. Uh, I think Sam Altman even just today posted something about what our glorious future is going to look like as we approach super intelligence or what have you. But I was thinking specifically about uh, media and Joanna Bot and what that might portend. Um, what do you see our information? S- ecosystem looking like in the coming years and feel free to give me both a utopian view and a dystopian view i guess i'll start with the dystopian view which is that i made a list and this is this column i'm working on for later in the week of like what were the things i learned from this project and all of the things add up to this not being worth it right now right like why Mm. would we do this like there are errors there are hallucinations it's getting things wrong sometimes it's going off topic it costs a lot of money, like a lot of money. Um, it doesn't sound very human. Like a lot of people are writing to me saying like, I just miss your voice. Don't give me this. Mm-hmm. And so if I think about all three of those things kind of going away or getting better, which the hallucinations we're told are going to get better. We kind of don't know the answer to that, but okay. We're told that the cost we're also told that's going to get better. Kind of. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You tell me. Better models, better chips. I right. Mean, it's going to happen to some right. extent. But then we'll just, we'll just want them to do more things. Um, <laughs> so, and maybe it starts have a to like. Good, pretty good capacity for <laughs> wanting to do things more with energy. Yeah. So, good point. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I guess the third point I'm less, I'm more optimistic on. And that's, I, like, I came away from this being in both of those camps. Like, I'm very optimistic that I have a future. Um, doing what I do, at least for a couple more years. Um, 
I also came <laughs> until, away. Until they make like, a hardware version of Joanna. To the, right, exactly. <laughs> but I really did come away thinking like I have a lot clearer vision of what a, how I should spend my time, you know, and how like mm. what is valuable to to the what is valuable that I put out in the journalism ecosystem. Um, but I guess the complete pessimistic, you know, doomer view is that all those things get better and we don't we the the bot can answer people's questions about what iPhone to get. Right. And just completely then then you're just not needed. It's a total reporter robot. I don't think that's gonna happen, my 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 view. Yeah. Um but yeah, I I noticed all the comments. Uh I I assume you read all the comments on your on your Joanna bot. And here it is. This is there's one that has 16 likes. I think it has the most likes. Says, if it hasn't already been said, I want to be the first to say that Joanna could never be replaced by a bot. There is no AI that can compete. 16 oh, likes. 16 likes on the Wall Street Journal comment <laughs> system. That is a lot. That is a lot. I mean, you, you know, gotta log in, right? I mean, you, you got to log in. You, you yeah. know, and we know where our commenters are spending their time on political posts. Um, but look, I, I like. It was a fascinating experiment for me, um, but yeah. I, I, th I just think these are the these are the questions, and that was uh, I also really something I wanted to play around. It was like we have to ask ourselves the questions about how this is going to fit in, and uh, it it we grapple with it, and we got to just try it out to see because if we don't, then we're never going to have the answers, or somebody else will get the answers for us. Yeah, and like you said, it's got its place, and it's it's got you focused on. Um, what, what you can offer and where you, where these things can excel and sort of save any time. Anyway. Yeah. And I think like one thing yeah. we didn't talk about, but like there have been some competing publications, you know, you mentioned the Washington post that did the, the climate bot. And one of the things that I just noticed from that is that's very conservative. Like it, if it does not, it, it has a very limited set of answers or, mm. or it's sticking to something really closely. And I didn't really want to create that. I mean, I also knew like, look, we could have more fun with the iPhone bot. And like, so it tries to insert some humor and it tries sometimes to, you know, make a joke. That's not funny. We specifically told it to tell dad jokes. Um, <laughs> but I think that's the fun in this, sure. like, and user and people have been writing to me being like, I'm so surprised how like compelling a conversation I had with it. Like we wanted to encourage it to keep going on and on because then like you just end up with a chat bot experience that's pre-programmed. And like we had, I don't know. 20 years ago, right? Like, mm -hmm. so kind of go back to your question before about like, you know, this open ended context and this question, like, it's also in the like, the AI to make that better. And through the right. prompts and the, like the engineering behind it to make this a thing that you want to keep talking to. I, I just you know, yeah. playing around with the Washington Post with like, you kind of hit some dead ends, and then that's it. And the, and the goal of that product might also just be to guide people to the Washington Post coverage, which we tried right. to do here, too. We tried to guide people to my reviews. Um, but I think it depends, like, th that's what all newsrooms are grappling with is what is the actual purpose of this? Is it user well, retention and audience engagement? Or is it, hey, we want to kick people out to read more of our information? Like, what is the real purpose of making this thing? Yeah, it's a really good point. And I'm glad we're sort of ending on this and sort of this major takeaway of like chat is fine and you get some audience insights, but also have a goal with it. And I think what generative uh, generative technology makes possible is that engagement now. Because before, you, like you said, it was all canned and it would just peter out at a certain point. At a certain point as a user, you're just like, oh, I get it. There's like three or four different paths I can go down yeah. and then it just gets repetitive and I'm done. But with generative, like, you know, the, the sky's the limit. Just keep going. Right. You can trade beauty secrets after a while. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> obviously, you put guardrails on yours, but I mean, like we did. But there's, there's to the person out there, out to the person out there who may be listening to this podcast, if you were the person who came and wanted to talk about rhubarb for like fifteen minutes, <laughs> you succeeded. And you know what? Did the journal provide you some really nice tips on rhubarb? I guess we did. So yeah. maybe that was our mission. All right. Well, <laughs> was it you? Those, it was you, well, Pete. It was me. I'll, I'll, I'll also put a call out to anyone who did that to at Joanna uh, <laughs> on X or wherever she may be. Uh, Joanna, thanks so much. It's been fantastic to catch up with you and chat about your chatbot. You too. Thank you for having me. And thank you for having this important podcast and newsletter around this topic. I read it all the time. Thank you. Uh, where can people find you online? Speaking of your handles. They can find me at wsj.com slash Joanna bot. Now they can find me at Joanna Stern, at Joanna Stern on everything, Instagram, 
awesome. X threads, not doing TikTok. Maybe one day LinkedIn. I'm there. I'm there on LinkedIn. All right. And until Joanna bot gets its own Twitter account, that'll be it for now. All right. Take care. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Joanna Stern. If you want to check out Joanna Bot, head on to wsj.com slash Joanna Bot. And if you like what you heard, please just take a minute to leave a rating or review for the Media Copilot in your podcast app. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Media Copilot newsletter and check out mediacopilot.ai for our classes on AI for journalists, marketers, and content creators. Be seeing you in the future. <laughs>